so today we're going to be looking at using Microsoft 365 to carry out our investigations. We're going to be looking at what, e what the e-discovery feature is, how we can use those for investigations, carry out investigations, looking at reporting and exporting the results of the e-discovery investigation. I will touch on licensing um, and we'll also look at Microsoft Priva for data subject requests especially. Okay, so if you do have questions, and feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them as we go through. Um, and obviously I will give you time as well towards the end to raise any questions, but we're quite a big group. So if you could keep them in the chat for now and we'll get to them at the end, that would be great. Thank you. So the e-discovery tool is for all sorts of different investigations and it's made up of um, four key products, content search, e-discovery standard, e-discovery premium and user data search. e-discovery standard did used to be called e-discovery core and e-discovery premium did used to be called advanced e-discovery. So you'll hear people referring to those different words, core, standard, advanced, premium. They mean very similar things. It's just the branding of them as the product. And then the content search is really what it sounds like it's quite a basic search solution and then we have the focus on users as well in specific search tools for those features you can think about the differences between the different e-discovery solutions um, as really the content search is purely your search it's a single keyword driven or condition driven search. We can export the results of the search and we have to have permissions to carry out that kind of search. A search in Microsoft 365 generally is really quite good, but we are limited to what we have standard permissions to access. You wouldn't expect anything else. But in, a, um, in an information discovery type role or in respect of any kind of investigation, we need to go further than our normal permissions. We need to search across multiple mailboxes, not just our own. We need to search across multiple Teams messages from multiple users. And that's where we would start using these e-discovery tools. And the content search is the first one of those. If we're searching for a very large volume of data though, it, it doesn't really do the job. And we also can't protect the content that we're looking at, that we're investigating whilst we carry out our search. So that's where e-discovery then starts coming in. We can create an e-discovery case, which we can build multiple searches into. So that means we can gather together different search criteria and keep them separated out to make it easier to handle the volume of information. We can put that content on hold while we carry out our searches and our investigations as well. OK, and give other people access to the case um, that we've set up. E-discovery premium then comes into play if we want to go a bit further. So if we've got a very large volume of data and we need to review the results and then determine which of those results are relevant to our case and focus on that content. So we want to get our content and then filter it. We want to tag content after the effect for follow up for further actions. We need to notify people that their content has been put on hold so it can't be deleted. And also, new feature just starting to roll out in preview at the moment is bringing in external guests to review the, fun the results that we found. And that's where we need to go to the premium. So three key solutions there. 
being able to carry out an e-discovery search or a content search is really quite a powerful feature. We have access across all sorts of different content that's stored in the tenant when we do this. So um, the data that we find could be in anyone's OneDrive, anyone's mailbox, anyone's Teams messages, any SharePoint site. And therefore, it's important that we make sure users with this ability don't abuse it. So every time you trigger any kind of new e-discovery case or new search, then you uh, an alert goes to the tenant administrators to let them know that this has been triggered so that you can't you can't do it under the hood, as it were. You can't keep it secret that you're trying to carry out this search. It's visible to other people in the tenant. And when we carry out any of these searches, we create a search, use it and specify the locations that we're searching, be it exchange, which you can hopefully just about read on this image, also includes um, group mailboxes, it includes Microsoft Teams channel messages, and also Yammer or Viva Engage messaging as well. SharePoint includes OneDrive, users OneDrives, all SharePoint sites, all Microsoft Teams files as well, and networks in Yammer where files are stored. We can then look at exchange public folders and it's possible to extend to connectors for on-prem data as well. Okay, once we've got that location set up, we then go and look at some kind of keywords. Okay, so as we're searching, we can specify the keywords that we're interested in. We're not just interested in everything that's in there that would be far too much content we we'd never be able to return that in any kind of search so you can put together um, a series of keywords that match what you're looking for and you can add conditions such as specific file type date and email was sent sender recipient all those sorts of additional criteria to filter it down OK, so combination of that. There is a specific language, KQL, the um, keyword query language um, that we can use to build our queries. And that's great if you've got a kind of search that you carry out a lot. Because we can build it up with this keyword and condition. Interface and that's great to build it up. And then we can specify, we can copy and paste, if you like, the, the query as it's been built. Bring up the editor, copy and paste the query, and then we don't have to rebuild it. Next time you want to do something similar, you can just copy and paste the same query back in to the KQL editor. If you're working with the keywords and the conditions to build it up, you don't need to worry about the syntax syntax, I'll get the right word eventually, of how you um, how you build up the structure, whether you use brackets, colons, speech marks, quotations, etc. The, the system does it for you. OK, there is a reference for the KQL editor that gives you all of the syntax in the official documentation as well. So. And then once you've carried out your search, you get a summary screen that tells you how much content it's found from where you can export the search results or the report. You can also edit your search and rerun it. You can copy it to tweak it and do a slightly different search. And you can also view the search statistics, which lets you know how, mu how much information was found, which of your conditions from your query were matched and which were not. And that can help you refine your query. 
you can see here we have there's a link here to download your condition search report, which will show me which conditions were matched and exactly how well my my search has run. OK, and I can see the different users and locations that the data was in. If I go to export the results. This allows me. Um, Sorry, I just noticed a question in the chat asking about the unindexed items. So this is where we have items that are stored in Microsoft 365 that haven't been indexed by the search or have been excluded from the search. Now that might be that they're duplicates. It might be that they are content that is corrupted. Um, and you can see that when you dig into the actual report of exactly what sort of items were undiscovered. And you'll see when we look at the export results that we do actually have um, the option to include the unindexed or unrecognized items as well. So they're not exported by default, but you have that option. And then when you're exporting the results, you also have the option to create um, as to how you export it. So as uh, email and any kind of messaging go into a PST file, which can then be opened in the Outlook client and viewed in there. So you can see the messaging threads if you switch on the threaded view. Um, and you can follow it through more precisely. So you can do one for each mailbox. You can do one PST file for everything. Again, there are size limitations. It depends on exactly how much data you found, which is the better option to, to use. OK, and you can deduplicate the messages as well. So where you found the same message in two mailboxes, you only need it once. OK. And then as we carry out the export, we use a specific search tool, which you'll see in a minute or download tool to carry out the export, which is an encrypted download. We need the encryption key. From here to carry it out. And then we have that data stored locally, wherever we point it to, but usually it's on the machine that you're downloading to or a network drive that it's connected to. With advanced e-discovery, you can point that export directly to an Azure file store as well if you prefer, but not another place in Microsoft 365. OK. When you go to export the report, it's very similar. We go to generate our report, shows up on the export tab. We can then open it and download it using the export tool that we've got an image of here. As I say, I will run you through this as a video in a little bit so you can see it in action. Once it's completed, you'll have a link to the report or the repository of the exported items um, that you can run through. And you see here that it's actually a little folder. The report itself has a summary file in it and a results file that gives me a list of everything in there as well. As part of the um, final screen once you've completed the report, you can also review samples. So this is again to help us refine the query and see if we've searched for the right thing, if it's finding the right results. So we can go in and look at examples of what it's found. Now this is designed around previewing emails. So you can see what the emails are that have come up in the search. If they're files, you have to download the file to view it. It doesn't show up in this viewer. So that is a limitation that we've um, 
that we've come across. So um, let's have a look at how we would create an e-discovery case. Now I'm using the standard e-discovery here, which is inside the E3 licensing. And just for clarity, when I mention E3, I'm also referring to A3, which is for academic organisations, schools, colleges, universities, and G3, in the government space as well. So that level three license, if you like, includes the e-discovery standard. If you're coming from a small organization, um, business premium licenses also include the e-discovery standard functionality. So we go in and create a case, not just a search this time, we're creating a whole case. So we give it a name, descriptive of what you're trying to do, perhaps you have a proper case number, and then you put in a description. Here I haven't done it because it's just a demo. And then it's created the case which I go into, and at that point I need to build my search. So this is where I can put in multiple searches. So I'm doing this one where I'm splitting it down by file types. I'm searching for material, training materials on a particular topic, but I'm going to split it down by file type so I don't get too much in each search result. So I'm going to put in the query, the keyword query, the keyword I'm looking for in those materials. And then I'm going to use a condition of a particular file type using the file extension. Now I know all of my files I'm interested in them in the new format, so I'm using the PPTX file extension. And then I submit my search. Now the reason I've done this as a video is just to speed up the process because some of them take a little bit of time. So I've um, edited out the waiting uh, times in some of these. Now you can see that search is starting and once it's finished I can see that it's completed and you can see I cheated and made a couple of other searches while I was off offline recording it. I can see that it's found a certain amount of content and I can go to my search statistics and review those and I can see that for each of the different searches. So each of the different searches give me these same results and statistics. OK, and I can see where it's found my content as well. Now, I can't quite split it down to specific SharePoint sites, so I've got to be careful with those conditions. Yeah, and then I can either go and review a sample or I can go and export the results or the report. So first of all, I'm going to review a sample. And again, this can sometimes be a little bit slow to load. And here you can see we found all sorts of different files, so I have to download those. OK, and then I can choose to export a report or the results. So we choose our options as to what we're going to export. Um, any exchange content we can deduplicate, not relevant for this one. And then I set it off exporting. Now it's created the job, so it's going to take a little while for that to run through. When it's done, I would go to the exports tab to see it. So it's same when it comes to the results as well, running through that. I'm going to zip the file to make it a little bit easier to download because 8.74 gigs quite a lot. Uh, the samples are quite limited in the volume of content they show and it's not always the same each time. OK. So once the report or export is ready to review, then we can go. And download it from that exports tab, as you see. So this one is still running through. So when I come to export my report, OK, I first of all need to copy this export key to my clipboard. Then I download the report which uses the client. 
the e-discovery export tool, I've got to paste the key in and tell it where I want the download to go. I'm going to put it into a, a folder called temp, which I keep on my desktop. Um, and if you were exporting exchange items, you can choose the name of the uh, email folder there. And you can see that report downloaded reasonably quickly. So then I can open the folder where my reports are and I can open the two different Excel files and see those both. So this is the summary and you can see it's got quite a lot of data in it about how many files I've got. So I know what I'm working with, the size of those files um, and the different locations it came from. And then I also have. Um, those locations are ID numbers, by the way, so we need a, a Microsoft 365 administrator to give us the information there. And then the uh, results list shows me all of the items that were found. So and their file paths. So if I had those exact, if I had access to those locations, I could go and view them in situ without needing to download them. OK. When it comes to the exporting the results, it's exactly the same process. OK, copy the key, hit the download, go through the export tool. And obviously, I'm not going to wait for this one to finish because this was eight and a half gig of data. It took quite a long time to download. Yeah. But again, choose where you want it to go. And off it goes. And then once I because I'd chosen the zip file, I would then have um, a results folder called SharePoint, which are all of my items from SharePoint with a zip file in there of each of the SharePoint sites and OneDrive that they came from. The reason we export the results is so that we can analyze them without interrupting the flow of normal work where that data is and we get a snapshot of them at that point in time. If we just rely on the fact that the content is still in Microsoft 365, then uh, we haven't got that kind of historic viewpoint, as it were. How that said, you can pull down the content, uh, sorry, the content that you're searching, you can also put on hold. Now, the idea of the hold is it stops that content being deleted whilst you carry out your investigation. OK, so if I need to rerun the search at any point in time, that content is still there, although it may have been edited in the meantime that the hold doesn't stop the content being edited. OK, so if you've done a search and exported it. And a user has changed it. When you rerun your search. You'll get the updated version. OK, unless it was marked as a record which preserves the integrity of the content. To add people in to review the search results before you export them, to review the case and to set it up, maybe refine the search results, then you can add people to the case with permissions. And that gives them the ability to access the content, to edit the search as well. Now, they do need an e-discovery role of some kind in the tenant that we have various different options, um, investigator, manager and administrator. So an investigator can review what's been found, whereas a manager can create and edit cases and an administrator can see everything as you'd expect. OK. Um, there is a question in the chat 
Oh, has someone got a question for me? Or an accidental unmute? I'm going to go with accidental. Um, there is a question in the chat talking about the threaded view. So Outlook, the Outlook client itself has a conversation view and you would enable that to view the emails in a thread. OK, that is the only way really we've got of turning this content into a threaded conversation. Well, even once we export it. Recently, Microsoft published an update to the user data search tool. So the user data search tool originally was called the GDPR tool, um, and it was a specific search set up to search for a user. Now it ran an e-discovery search in the background, but it meant Microsoft were then maintaining three, uh, four different search tools, content search, user data search, e-discovery, standard and e-discovery advanced. So they are retiring the user data search case tool. And this is where I would suggest you take this query as per the editor and make a copy of it so that you can use that in the future. And that's a great example of how you could search for multiple types of content. So this is looking for username in the participant. In fact, let me just zoom that in for you a little bit here. OK, so in the participant, the author or the created by fields, and it's looking for different types of documents, so documents, notes, conversation, voice call, yeah, or a note about a missed item. So it's looking for all kinds of communications and all kinds of files. So instead of using the user data search tool going forward, we will basically use eDiscovery. And what I was saying is we can just go and copy this content. If you don't have access to the message center, get your admins to copy that out for you so you can use it. We create a search with a name, whoever, whatever you're searching for. OK. And then you copy your search criteria. Hurry up, Sarah, go faster. I always type so slowly when I'm watching it back on screen. It seems so quick when I do it, but it looks so slow when I watch it as a video. I've got to give each search a name. OK, and then I choose what locations I'm searching across. And then I go into my search and ideally into the KQL editor because that's what this is. It's a KQL query and I edit the search in here. Now there's a couple of errors that it's complaining about in here. Mm -hmm. One of them being an extra speech mark at the end. So I'll get rid of that. It's also containing about complaining about a potential syntax error with those item classes at the end. And it, it isn't a problem. It's just because it thinks those, um, you see it's complaining about the item classes being at the end. So it was, it thinks they're in the wrong place. Now the reason my search failed is because my search name was not unique. Each name has to be unique even across all of your multiple e-discovery searches. Content search, e-discovery standard, e-discovery advanced, that name's got to be unique. OK, so we submit it again and this time it will work. The fail still shows up, but it did work. And then I can go on and do my review of the features, etc. So that was using eDiscovery standard. Let's move on to premium. 
So with premium, these are all of the different features. Now I'm going to touch on a lot of them, um, but mainly if you look at them, these are based around ensuring that the um, that the content that we're exporting or focusing on is refined down to the appropriate content. So um, optical character recognition, so it can search inside photos and PDFs. Advanced indexing, so it can have a look, uh, it can find more content, including content marked with sensitivity labels. Conversation threading, so the conversations are pre-threaded before you export them. Okay, and it pulls the, the conversations together and is therefore also better at deduplication, de removing the repeated messages which sit in multiple mailboxes. Once we've done our search, we can then go on and filter them further into so our original search gives us a review set slightly different terminology so then i can filter that review set down further and also we, we can tag the content we can um, notify our users that we've put content on hold we can search for content based on the custodian based on the person who owns the location rather than just on keywords which allows me to say, <clears throat> oh, we need to investigate what Jenny's been doing. Let's have a look at everything Jenny owns and manages, every team, every SharePoint site, every mailbox and OneDrive as well. So I don't have to specify all of those locations. The other thing we get is, a, is access to the settings so we can configure a lot better how the tool works for us and our organization. And as you can see, the premium e-discovery tool does sit in the more premium license. So it's only available in the level five license, A5, E5, G5. OK. And one of the reasons this becomes so useful is not just those things that I highlighted as the premium difference, but also what it can find. So it can find reactions on Teams messages. So if someone reacts to a message in the chat here, gives them a thumbs up, we can find, we, we get that information with the e-discovery. So included in our conversation of all of the messages that were going backwards and forwards are the reactions. And yes, Teams conversations do also get threaded as well if you use the conversation threading option. So if we go into those settings, we have things like the historic version. So we can see what version of a file users shared at a particular point in time. We can choose to allow guest users. We can set up templates for communication, for notifications to uh, the people we're investigating or whose content as content owners we're looking at. Now, so, and who's sending those notifications as the issuing officer. So there's lots of settings there that we can go into. Only just released in the last few months is the ability to take a standard or an e-discovery standard case and upgrade it to premium. So you can start off as a basic, upgrade it to premium, rerun your searches and get the advantage. So here we go. Take a basic search like my Microsoft Viva and upgrade it. And then once it's gone across, Um, give it a refresh, it will disappear from eDiscovery Standard and reappear in eDiscovery Premium. Now I might need to give this a refresh. 
Da, da, da. It's almost like I did it before. Here's one I did earlier. Um, so then I've got my premium e-discovery case. I've got my data sources. Now I haven't defined those because I did them in the search, which is now a collection because it's collecting the data in. Now it's on an estimated amount of content in here because the eDiscovery Premium can find more files. Okay. I mentioned the notifications, the communications, the um, alerts that an eDiscovery case has been created go to global admins and eDiscovery administrators. The communications that you send as part of a case, you choose who they go to, be it an individual, an owner of content, um, or you can copy in other people as well. Okay. So it depends what case notification you're thinking about who that actually goes to. A need discovery premium case is a little bit more involved. So the the workflow at, the, at a very high level is we add custodians. You don't have to, but typically we add custodians to say we are looking for content that is stored in the location owned by this person, they're the team owner, the SharePoint site owner, or it's their personal mailbox or OneDrive. Once you've got your custodians on your case, you then go and add your collection. You go and collect your content, that initial search. What do I want to look across? I don't want to look everything in Microsoft 365. Let's focus it a bit. And that's where I can add in other locations other than just data owned by the custodian. Once it's done the collection, that initial search, we then go and carry out a review of that. We commit that collection to a review set. So we pull it into a review set and then further search across it. And then we can analyze that data in that review set and export it. Okay. When we're the, the advantage of specifying sites and custodians is what we're looking for is any content in that space, including anything in the, the normal storage, the recycle bin, or the preservation hold library for SharePoint and OneDrive, or the um, recoverable items and litigation hold folders in the messaging side of things for email and Teams messages. So all of my content right the way across the piece. Let's look at that workflow in a little bit more detail. So something happens in the organisation that triggers us wanting to carry out this investigation. It might be a request, or something comes in. Uh, so we go and create our case. We then dig deep, oh, we then add our custodians. And at this point, we can also put that at their content on hold. So perhaps that's when you'd send them the notification to say their content has been put on hold as you add them as a custodian to the case you're investigating. And then, you can carry out your data collection, which might be only Microsoft 365 or could be also third party sources if that connector has been configured. Now, at this point, it's it, the system is trawling that data, looking at the um, looking at investigating the the files using OCR, using a PS, um, any PST files, media, 
and it recrawls, it keeps researching. So if it meets an error, it keeps going back, whereas eDiscovery Standard doesn't. OK. Um, and then once we've done that, we can do our review. So we further review that content that we've been that we've found. We can also control the settings here to control the deduplication of data, what we count as a duplicate, how close they have to match. And we can also then tag those results so we can tag it and then run a Power Automate or a PowerShell script to carry out some form of action on that content that's been tagged. So delete it, apply a retention label, apply a sensitivity label, something like that. Or we can export that content. Now, the idea of exporting is we can ship it to third party investigators, but as we said, we can now pull those in. OK. So that's a different way of looking at that. Once we have finished with the case, when you mark the case as closed, the hold that you put on the data is removed. It goes back to following standard retention settings for that content, whatever those settings are. OK, so eDiscovery hold is only applicable as long as that case is open. Once you close the case, the hold is removed. You can also remove a hold manually without closing the case. Okay. So hopefully what you've seen there is that we have a lot of common features across all of those search tools. They can all do searches. They all have a report as to what they found. They can all export their data and their results. eDiscovery Standard uses the E3, A3, G3 or Business Premium or requires those licenses. Um, business Premium is currently limited to Exchange only. It can only search across the email content. OK. If you want to dig deeper into the licensing, I will put you a link in the chat in a second once I'm not doing three things with my hands at once. Um, and then there's the eDiscovery Premium uses the E5A5G5 license. Now, Microsoft have also introduced for us another search tool aimed at private data, personal data, which is part of Microsoft Priva, and it's called the Subjects Rights Request. It's an add-on license. It's not included in anything. So here we can search for a data subject, be that a current employee or a potential employee. We choose their country of residence, which determines the legislation as to what is classed as personal data and the legislation under which we're carrying out our search. You can also go and edit the content. And if I just pause that, let's just go back a second. Oh, gone too far. E -e 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 -e. Go on to the advanced, go on to edit it. Two seconds, it's nearly there. Going to view the settings. OK, so if you look here. You can see that condition is built up basically the same way you can in your eDiscovery searches, so you could build this yourself. OK. And you will also have seen at the beginning here as we went to create our request, we had a choice as to what we were doing with this request. Are we just looking at it for data access? Are we looking to export the data? Are we looking to tag it for further action? So that's built in automatically into this tool. As I say, this is an add-on license. It's not included in, sorry, clicking without realizing. It's not included in any of the Microsoft 365 license products, but it is very helpful 
if you're going to carry out those searches because it's all built into the interface rather than you having to run PowerShell to tag the content or, or to carry out actions on tagged content. I think I've dealt with most of the questions in the chat, but we do have a couple of minutes um, if anyone does have any additional questions before we uh, close out the session? Did you spot any that I didn't answer, Jenny? I think I did all of them apart from um, there was one from quite a long question at about 20 past the hour looking at um, the recommendations for optimizing the search in the review set um, it's a question of you have to do your initial search and then look at what you can how you can review it um, sometimes it, it's important to build those collections those initial searches quite refined i did by file type because I knew I was going to find different types of files. So that was quite helpful in that example. But it might be um, that you want to look at it by definitely by location. I would split it by location. Um, date ranges can be very helpful as well. Um, you know, look at the different criteria to split it into different collections. So you're not giving yourself too unmanageable a job once you start reviewing those. We've got another question popped up. I'll just answer that while we're while we're showing this. So will eDiscovery only search live data if someone deletes it? Will it go from the search? So it depends. OK, if that data is subject to a retention policy, it will go into the retained locations, in which case it will be covered. Um, if you find it while it's in the recycle bin process, then it will show up in your e-discovery search, which is why we tend to put it on hold so it can't go into the recycle bin, because then it will be cleared after a fixed period of time. So it will find content in the process of being deleted as well. If you do want to know more, we are running um, a longer course. So um, depending on where you're located, different time zones for different signups, um, please do feel free to have a look at that course and have a sign up, have a look at signing up for that. If you give us a minute or two, Jenny and I will paste the link into the meeting chat here as well for all of these things that we're sharing the QR codes for. Um, and I do notice we've got a quick hand up. Just Sorry, sorry, because I just thought, oh, when I, can I use eDiscovery to enable me to run a report to work out the duplicates that I've got in SharePoint? So when I'm doing my SharePoint migration, I can work out where similar files are and export that and compare it to something else. Or is that what gets really too complicated? Um, I know it's not what this no, is for. You is could it? have yeah um it wouldn't tell you what the duplicates were it would just show you what your content was without duplicates right so i don't get like the checksum or anything like that that i could then compare anything with anything else no ah, right okay i've done the other stuff so that's fine but i was just wondering if i could <laughs> use it for other means <laughs> right no okay. um not not that I have come across anyone successfully having done it. Shall we put it that way? We do also go further than just e-discovery. So if you want to know any more about any of our courses, we've got introductory level courses, intermediate and advanced and can also do custom courses as well. So again, please do check out the courses and the websites. And last but not least, thank you all very much. Thank you all.